First of all, thank you to all of you for, for taking time out of the schedule. I know there's a lot going on. I have a lot of friends speaking here. Um, and thank you to everyone at Denver's Guide and for the Athens Bar Show. I, this is my first time at the Bar Show in Athens. Congratulations. <laughs> it's a hell of a show. Um, it's not my first time in Athens, though. For those of you who don't know, I've been coming here for a very long time. And what I mean by that is that I've been doing this for a long time. I'm honored to be able to do this. I started coming here originally, I came here in the 80s because I was pouring Greek wines in my restaurants in the United States and we didn't have any to choose from. And it was the beginning and there wasn't really a renaissance yet, but I tasted a couple things. And in the 90s I tasted a couple more. In the late 90s I started coming here regularly and by the time 2001 rolled around I saw that there was this huge renaissance happening that the world didn't know about. So by 2003 I had become a fanatic of Greek wine and spirits and was teaching about them and sharing them all over the world. And as a result, I basically was making an excuse to come to Greece as often as possible, not only because I love the food and I love your culture and I love the place, but most importantly, um, I think your, your greatest national asset is you, the people. And I come here for that. Um, and I am here today for that very reason. As I was lucky enough to begin to experience the renaissance of Greek bartending, um, because it's happened during the times that I've been here, and being involved in the trade, it was something I always watched and monitored. The fact that Telly won the World Championships put you guys on the map, but as you all know, it was already happening here, or you wouldn't have had that opportunity, and quite frankly, it just kept building. And probably, for me, the most exciting part about the Renaissance in this country is the community. It's the way all of the bartenders here share with one another and collaborate with one another. And quite frankly, that's what makes our community great. Whether it's in the UK or the United States or Australia, it doesn't matter. Wherever we are, when we come together, that's what shows like this are about. We all come together to share information. And to me, it is my motivating force. It's what drove me to do this. I've been doing it for over 40 years, believe it or not, and I knew as a young person in this business what I wanted out of it was, number one, I wanted it to become a craft and a profession where I could have this much respect. I didn't need much. But if I got asked one more time what I was gonna do when I grew up, if I got asked one more time what I did for a day job or you know what I was going to do at the next stage once I'd done this fun thing, and I was very serious about it and I knew this is what I wanted to do. And for 30 plus years I worked really hard to help to create this community to help to make this into a profession we can all be proud of. And believe me, it's not just me. There are hundreds of us all over the globe and now tens of thousands, which is amazing. I think the most amazing thing to me today is the young people, as many of you are in this room, that come to me and want to learn and want to be bartender. You say, how do I get your job? I want to be a bartender. That didn't happen in the old days. We became bartenders mostly by accident. And to me, it's an incredibly beautiful thing. Now, did everybody get two cocktails? Have you all taken your second dose? Have you gotten your, your two little medicine cups? I'm sorry, they're so small. You can barely even taste them. That's what I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, when I first started coming here to taste the amazing wines and spirits, I was blown away by the quality level that you guys took for granted. I was blown away by the stuff that was like just off the shelf that you could get. What I was most blown away by were the 600 indigenous grapes growing that nobody had ever heard of that nobody knew what to do with, some of which were lost forever, that were being grown in certain places around this country in isolated vineyards that were making some of the most special wines I'd ever tasted in my life. And in the late 90s and early 2000s area, that time period, winemakers were ripping this stuff out and planting Chardonnay and Merlot and Cabernet, Sauvignon Blanc in particular around here, because they believed that that was the future. And they thought the only way to get their foot in the door of the American public was to make Chardonnay and Merlot. And I said, oh no, please, please, stop, stop, stop. 
your treasure, your point of difference, your amazing moment will be the indigenous grapes. You just got to give us a little time. Give us time to teach people about these grapes. Give us time to teach people how to pronounce them. For me, the hardest part, I mean, now I can say, si no madre, and I can say, adiargitico, because I practiced for years. But I said to them, you're worried about us pronouncing your grapes. We taught an entire nation to pronounce gluner that leaner, and if we can do that, we can certainly learn how to say most profitable. It's easy, and it's sexy. So, what if you just stick with what you're doing and let us help you bring it to the world? Don't change a thing. Make your indigenous grapes. Have them grow in those ancient soils, in those sometimes never seen phylacteras, in the most remote vineyard sites, up in the mountains where nobody could imagine that you could grow grapes. Because what you have is magic. And in my time working with these people, I experienced their lives. I experienced their culture. I experienced their food. And I experienced spirits along the way. It kind of blew my mind. Because it was something they considered just part of a meal. Something they considered just part of what they do. Something that was so obvious and natural to them. But of course, you'd never drink it in a bottle. You never pour it anywhere except at the end of the day. Or maybe with some mist, you know, maybe in a bar. But but only for appetizers, never for anything serious. And I said, you know, you've got a treasure over here. You've got something really, really special. So, let me tell you what is going on in those days. I know this big mystery here. Can I tell them now? Is it time to start talking about the mystery? All right. The first drink that you have is a drink called Great Crush. It's a drink that I've served in several bars, and when I first created it, it became a huge hit in the Lower East Side of Manhattan because it was summertime, and it's refreshing, and we needed that drink as kind of a welcome cocktail. And it's pretty simple to make, and it's pretty obvious, and it's pretty delicious. You like it? I mean, it's delicious. Really easy. And it is, of course, grapes, obviously. Great Crush, we call it. The Great Crush is fresh seedless grapes. We use lemon like you would in a caipirinha. So we muddle demerara sugar and lemons instead of limes because of the spirit that we're using. Then we add some grapes and muddle that in. And the spirit that we used in that cocktail is um, something that you know, but I'm going to say that for you. The second drink will tell you more about this spirit because that is another of my drinks, and that is a drink that speaks a lot to who I am and what I'm about. I was in Los Angeles and I was doing a charity event with some other bartenders. We were doing a guest bartending gig. And we were focusing on certain spirits that I love, that they love. It was a, a mezcaleria, so we were doing Latin stuff. And in my bag, I had a bottle of something that I really loved that I wanted to share with the guys. And I broke it out and we tasted it and they all freaked out over it. And I was saying, I know, this is like my pet. This is my baby. I love this stuff. I can't seem to get anybody to think about it. Every time I put it in a cocktail, they freak out. As long as I don't tell them it's in there, they freak out about it. So I made this drink with two of my, the best bartenders in the world. I don't know, Ryan Fitzgerald or Raul Lear Stroza. They're two buddies of mine. We were all together. We're all behind the bar. And we decided that we should make a drink with my favorite things. A few of my favorite things. Um, mezcal. I think you all probably know my thing about mezcal. So it is Santo Domingo Alvarados from Del Mar. Sherry. You probably all know that I've worked with Spain also for many, many years, and sherry is kind of my thing. So it's Lustau East India Solera. And the third ingredient of what we ended up calling a drink at the time that night, we called it the Holy Trinity. Then we realized we would probably piss off a lot of people if we called a drink the Holy Trinity. So we changed the name to the Holy Trinity because as Olsen, as a kid growing up in a Norwegian town, Olsen is called Oli. So Oli Olsen, so it's the Oli Trinity because there's a, my three ingredients. Mezcal, sherry, and sipa. That's what's in that drink. Then the bitters, it needed bitters. But instead of using bitters, we use bitter, an amar, an amari in this case. 
a little bit of Chino. So it's basically equal parts mezcal and cipro, with three quarters of a part of this kind of sweet, beautiful old sherry, and just a little bit of chinar with an orange peel on top. Very simple, very straightforward, exactly the way I like to drink. And we started calling it the Holy Trinity and then changed the name to Holy Trinity. And the reason that I wanted to put these both out there is because I wanted you, to, I want to put my money where my mouth is. This is all happening today because I made a statement. I think it was at World Class, wasn't it? Judging World Class? I was being interviewed by some amazing journalists from this country. And we were talking about World Class and all this other stuff. And I'm like, all I wanted to talk about was Cipro. They're like, what, are you crazy about it? I said, yes, I am. Because it drives me crazy that Greek bartenders don't serve Cipro in their bars. And I said, it's probably the most underestimated spirit in the entire planet. And then he said, can I quote you on that? I said, yes, I'm serious, can you tell? So let me tell you a little bit about why I'm so anxious and excited up here. Here's the deal. It is a farmer spirit. It is a village spirit. It is a community spirit. It is part of your freaking culture. It is part of your history. And you've decided, I guess, except for three or four of you in the planet, that it isn't good enough for your bars. And yet every time I show a bottle to any of my friends anywhere in the world, they freak out. They're like, how do I not know about that? And I said, nobody seems to. Maybe it's only because there's a tiny bit. So when I first can imagine sitting with winemakers in a meal, talking about the future of winemaking in Greece, and at the end of the meal, they drop this crazy-ass brandy in front of me, and I taste this stuff, and it's the best one I've ever had at that moment, and I'm like, oh, right, wait a minute. Just stop talking. Who made this one? Oh, it's these guys over here. We give them our pumice and the blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, stop this minute. What is this? So... I'm going to tell you what it is. I'm going to tell you why I'm here. I'm going to explain this to you, and I'm going to ask you to just suspend your beliefs for a moment. I'm going to ask you to just, all the things you've been taught culturally, all the things you've been taught in bartending, all the things you've been taught by your friends and your peers and growing up and whatever, just take it with a global viewpoint. Because, see, it drives me crazy that when I come here, and I want to drink a Cipro in a great cocktail bar, you want to show me all the shit that I see everywhere else. You want to show me how global you've become by showing me the world's global spirits, and I think that's awesome. You want to show me the techniques you've picked up in bars and in conferences around the world, and I think that's amazing. But the thing is, why wouldn't you bring that back to your own indigenous juice? To me, there's an opportunity here, and I think we're just missing out on some of the historical aspect that maybe we should take into consideration. So, bear with me a second. When I first started working in Mezcal, the first producers that we started working with, one of them, the family had a still. The very first producer we ever worked with was using a community still there was one still in the village. And in between farming and subsistence lifestyle and everything else they did, the farmers would go out and harvest agaves in the wild. They'd bring the agaves down and they would roast them. Then they'd go and use the community still to make a batch of mezcal. And they would trade mezcal or money. This is Oaxaca, so maybe a goat or a chicken. And they would get their mezcal that they used from the community still because nobody could afford them. The first time I tasted cipro in this country, I tasted cipro that was made by a guy in the neighboring village because he had the still. And the winemaker that I was with gave him wine and all of his pumice so that he could make cipro for himself 
and give him his year's supply to drink with his friends and at dinner. What is the difference? It's a community. It's a farmer-made spirit. It's indigenous to your country. So, when I first started working in Mezcal, I know you think Mezcal is the hottest thing right now, it's the fastest growing spirit, in it's awesome. We started 21 years ago preaching the gospel of Mezcal. For 17 of those years, nobody drank Mezcal except for seven of my friends who are all in this room right now. It was just us. A few bartenders, a few sommeliers, and a few chefs. But slowly but surely, champions of the product, we took it to the world. In Mexico, there's a tradition Mezcal is that moonshot. It's that nasty stuff. It's white lightning. You don't drink Mezcal because you'll go blind. Now you all think it's really cool because you've met Mexican bartenders lately, or you've been to Day Efe lately in Mexico City, and they're drinking Mezcal now. Five years ago, you couldn't drink Mezcal in Mexico City. And the young people in Mexico would tell you it's terrible. We don't drink that shit. We only drink tequila. Five years ago. Eight years ago, there was not one mezcaleria in the country of Mexico. Not in Oaxaca, not in Puebla, not in Michoacan, and certainly not in Mexico City. You couldn't drink pulque unless you went to a farm and found it. I went in search of pulque and spent two weeks Finding pulque 20 years ago. Today, there are pulquerias and mezcalerias, 36 of them in Mexico City. The first one opened six years ago. Now, how much of a change in attitude is that? They wouldn't touch the stuff because the thought process, the way they were raised, is it was bad. Now, granted, there is bad mezcal. And there's probably bad spirit here, too. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about supporting farmers. I'm talking about embracing artisanal, crafted spirits. Those were two different Cipros in those drinks. Did everybody get another cup right now? Guess what we're gonna do now? Taste some straight Cipro. Single Murado, handmade, artisanal Cipro. Now you try to tell me that that doesn't belong on the world platform of great quality spirits. <coughs> I'm not done. Don't take my word. I've got friends. I've got some people who are going to talk to you. But lest you should think that this is new to me or me making this up, I want you to understand that all the way back in the Hellenistic period, they were doing distillation of a product called Prima, which became Cipro later. That in Mount Athos area, they created this concept of what we know today as Cipro. The first tax laws on alcohol in this country were not on wine. They were on Cipro back in 1883. And you know how tax laws on alcohol work, right? Got to tax that because that's our, our luxury. All right? In 1886, there were laws that were passed that changed the way we think about it. But in 1989, they created this thing of official distillers, which began to change this little local community thing that I'm preaching and, and teaching. But... It also took some of those guys that made them the official distiller for their area, which made it beautiful and changed the way we think about it. But if you don't believe me, is this not enough? In 2006, the EU gave Cipro, Sicudia, and Uzo a PDO. Do you know what that means to the rest of the world? These are Greek spirits made with Greek grapes by Greek producers in Greek, on Greek land in Greece, for God's sakes. Does that not speak from your, forget, I'm, I'm American for God's sakes. To me, look, think about it this way. If I were to go to Edinburgh and ask for a scotch and they tried to talk me into drinking vodka, I'd want to punch the guy in the face, okay? If I were to go to Mexico and I wanted to try a mezcal or a tequila, and they tried to make me drink their new gin, I'd be like, are you out of your mind? And yet I come here and I can't even find a Cipro. Because what? 
Because you haven't found that quality? Because you're not in I, I, I've got more, but right now I'm going to call upon some friends that are going to help me with this, okay? Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little video. Most of you know who Sullivan does. Sullivan has sent us a video about the use of indigenous spirits and at his bar, and I want you to hear what he has to say. Just please, bear with me. We're almost through the pain, I promise. Hello, Firuz. My name is Sullivan Do. I'm in Germany for the day, Sullivan uh, Do. I've been partnering for a while now, and uh, as you can see, in every bar, there's uh, every single country drink alcohol. So that's why in Paris, as a French guy, I decided to open the Syndica, the very first cocktail bar using only French alcohol to support uh, our local uh, producers and uh, just to showcase the diversity we have in terms of alcohol. Uh, with my partner, we just like drove everywhere in France to meet the producers straight in at the same person on our bar. bar. We met the guy who make it, so it gave us the ability to really talk about it and uh, to share all this knowledge with the customer. Um, last time I went in Greece was in May, and I had the opportunity to do a guest party in a restaurant in Alisa called Mezen. And uh, Greg Chambers, the owner, showed me a lot of uh, different types of tipolo. Uh, and I believe that in Greece you have enough diversity to focus a bit on your product to showcase. I mean, I've been doing really well with the Mastica in every bar, in every, co every cocktail menu has a cocktail of Mastica, but I believe that tipolo and the Hakomelo, etc. Even in France, in Paris, we have a, a nice diversity of uh, Greek product. And uh, so yeah, I think the next time I come to Greece, I would love to to be uh, uh, informed about the like, different quality of Cipro and uh, just sitting at a bar and drink your product because they're really amazing. Hello, Philos. My name is Sullivan Do. For the third time, for another day, Sullivan Do. Ah, it's the same one. It's not on the. <laughs> I can listen to him again. Okay, there's more. I'm not alone in this fight, all right? Some of you may know Yanni, Yanni Samanis, from The Trap. He's one of the handful of bartenders I've met in Greece who actually has embraced Cipro, actually likes it, and actually makes cocktails from it. And we were going to feature one of his today, but they wanted to feature mine, because that is putting my money where my mouth is. But I want him to talk to you about some of the things he does with it in a Greek bar in Athens. Καλησπέρα σε όλους. Δεν ξέρω αν ακούγομαι. Ακούγομαι. Τώρα ακούγομαι. Λοιπόν, καλησπέρα σε όλους. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ που με καλέσετε εδώ σήμερα. Ε, έχω να πω δύο πράγματα. Σε πρώτη φάση νιώθω πολύ μεγάλος για τον λόγο που είπε πριν, ο Στυλ, και πολύ μικρός παράλληλα γιατί 10 μήνες πριν δεν σε έπαιρνα ούτε τσίπουρο του ούζου στο πάρτι. Σίγουρα μια παρότριση στο να μπούμε σε μια τέτοια διαδικασία εγώ και τα παιδιά τα οποία δουλεύουμε στο τραπ και συμβάλλα σε αυτό το κατάλογο, δηλαδή ο Στέφανος Περγανιτάκης και ο Γιάννης Αλεξόπουλος, ήταν το ταξίδι μας στην Γαλλία, στο Πάρκο Σάλβα, ο οποίος χρησιμοποιεί μόνο γαλλικά προϊόντα. Ε, σίγουρα ήταν το event που κάναμε στη Λάρισα παράλληλα με το Σάλβα και σίγουρα ήταν και όλη αυτή η εποχή που δυσκολεύει πάρα πολύ την κατάσταση στα πάρες. Ε, αυτό το οποίο λοιπόν ε, με καλέσανε να, να σα πω εδώ απόψε, Σήμερα, είναι ότι ο λόγο ο οποίο ξεκινήσαμε να χρησιμοποιούμε ελληνικά προϊόντα ε, στο μαγαζί, οι λόγοι ήταν δύο. Επηρεαστήκαμε πάρα πολύ από την παγκόσμια αγορά και αντιληφθήκαμε άθελά μα ότι ενώ ταξιδεύουμε πάρα πολύ, κάθε φορά για δώρο πηγαίνουμε ένα ελληνικό μπράδι, το οποίο μπορεί να είναι ούζο, μπορεί να είναι τσίπουρο, μπορεί να είναι μαστίχα ή ένα κρασί. Ε, Αυτομάτω συνειδητοποίησαμε ότι όλα αυτά τα οποία εμεί πηγαίνουμε. Ε, σαν ένα γεωνιότερο δώρο προ του ανθρώπου που θα μα φιλοξενήσουν στο εξωτερικό, δεν τα χρησιμοποιούμε στα ίδια μα τα μπαρ. Οπότε όλο αυτό δούλεψε κάπω υποσυνείδητα στο μυαλό μα και ξεκινήσαμε σιγά σιγά να αντικαταστούμε πράγματα τα οποία ήταν όπω π.χ. το αψέντη, χωρί να παροτρύνουμε κάποιον ε, να μην χρησιμοποιεί όλα αυτά τα προϊόντα. Απλά έτσι σκεφτήκαμε εμεί. Αντικαταστήσαμε το αψέντη ε, σε κάποια κοκτέιλ τα οποία χρειαζόταν. Αρκετή περιπτώτητα σε γλυκάνισο, χρησιμοποιούσαμε κούζο. Ε, Αντικαταστήσαμε π.χ. το πίσκο, το οποίο είναι ένα αποσταλμό από στα φίλια, 
και αντί να χρησιμοποιήσουν το επίσκοπο, χρησιμοποιήσαν το τσίποδο. Ε, και κάπω έτσι ξεκίνησε όλο το κατάλογο και εξελίχθηκε. Και αν έρθετε στο μαγαζί, θα συνειδητοποιήσετε ότι πάρα πολλά ε, προϊόντα μέσα στο κατάλογο, αν το δείτε λίγο αναλυτικά ίσω, γιατί δυστυχώ η προκατάληψη η οποία έχουμε για τα ελληνικά προϊόντα δεν μα επιτρέπει να γράφουμε ούζο ή τσίπουρο, αλλά να αναφέρουμε π.χ. απόσταγμα από στα φίλια, γιατί ακόμα και οι πελάτε κλωτσάνε δυστυχώ και δεν το γνωρίζουμε τον λόγο. Ε, και σιγά σιγά όλο αυτό έχει αρχίσει και δουλεύει. Ε, σίγουρα είναι τιμή μου που βρίσκουμε, βρίσκομαι εδώ ε, και με έχει καλέσει ο Στίβ να μιλήσω για αυτό το κομμάτι των ελληνικών προϊόντων. Ε, σίγουρα είναι τιμή μα που σαν χώρα έχουμε διοργανώσει κάτι τόσο μεγάλο. Τόσοι άνθρωποι από το εξωτερικό έρχονται και μα βλέπουν και μα ε, μας συμβουλεύουν και κατά, κατά, κατά κάποιο τρόπο. Αλλά σίγουρα δεν είναι τιμή μα αυτό το οποίο κάνουμε τόσα χρόνια και παρακαταθέτουμε ότι έκανα και εγώ πριν 10 μήνε στον πάρκο. Δεν σε λυγάμε, δεν τις υπολογιούσα. Ε, Επίσης όλη αυτή η παρότρινση, μαζί με το τι φορκά και το στυλ, να μας οδηγεί σε ένα άλλο μπάτι, όπως εξελίχθηκαν και άλλα προϊόντα παγκοσμίως, πιστεύω. Ε, αυτά είχα να πω. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ και πάλι. Έχουμε ένα μόνο βίντεο που θέλω να δω από κάποιον που θέλω να δω. Έναν που έχω ευχαριστήσει να δω για πολλές χρόνες και να δω για πολλές χρόνες και να δω για πολλές χρόνες. I'm honored that he considers me his friend, because to me he's one of the greatest people I've ever met in my life. Um, and he taught me a lot. And it was actually with him that I was having dinner that I, it wasn't my first secret. It was my first moment where I said, oh my God, who is that? Um, I've had the opportunity to travel this country. And in my years of working here, get to know a lot of amazing, amazing people. And I told you earlier, that's what keeps me coming back. You know, we, we had our, we're all going to be dealing with the tragedy that happened in the United States last night. I'm sick about it. We can't even talk, please. I'm worried about my children. I'm worried about my future. I'm worried about my home. I'm mostly worried about all of the producers in Mexico who I consider my family because they won't be able to climb the wall, but they will certainly tunnel under it. The issue, though, is that you've been through your thing, and yet we managed. And I kept coming back here over and over and over, even when, even when I couldn't get money out of your banks for my, for my consultancies, because that's what we do. We do this because we love it and we care. It can't always be about money, can it? To me, what I have seen out there in meeting the people who actually make the products I'm talking about. And you're right, it includes Mastika, it includes Uzo. Because I don't know if you even realize, Uzo comes from Sipero. It's become your national spirit, but Uzo, you know how Sipero can be both flavored and not flavored? Well, flavored Uzo, flavored Sipero is where Uzo comes from. If you do your research and go back in history, it was flavored Sipero that became the category of Uzo. Um, and I can tell you more about that maybe in another seminar because we don't have time today. But, and I'm a fanatic for all of them. And I use them all in bars all over the world, much less in the United States. But one thing I've seen here is the pride in artisanal distillation. The largest producers here make very artisanal products. And what most of the world thinks Uzo is, for example, is something sweet and Sambuca-like. But what we know here is it's complex, it's dry, it's often distilled almost to proof or even to proof. Um, you know, there's the consumer ones, but the most of them are really artisanal products. And what I would say to you is this, um, you know, I know I got a little bit animated a few moments ago. I really mean this. When I started working in Mezcal, it wasn't about turning the world on to Mezcal. I didn't know this was gonna happen. I didn't know that one day everybody would drink Mezcal, but I knew it was, the right thing to do. I knew that it was one of the greatest spirits in the world. I knew that I was going to turn people on to this because I knew that I knew people that when they tasted it, would feel it. They would taste it and freak out, but they would also feel it. And that's what that spirit is about. When I taste Cipro, I feel it. It's different than factory-made stuff. And what I say to you is, you have an opportunity right now to embrace this. 
You have an opportunity right now to take this spirit and make it your own. Like you said, why is this? I love Pisco too. Can you imagine? I work with a Pisco. I help design Pisco. I go to Chile and Peru. I love them. But can you imagine if I went to Peru and ordered a Pisco sour and they told me, oh, let me pour you a Cipro drink? But you do that here with their drink. I don't get it. They're, they're similar. They're both made from similar grapes. And yet you're selling theirs. You think they're selling yours? Don't think so. You want to help your own economy? You want to build your own nation? You want to have pride in who you are and what you do? This to me is an absolute no-brainer. I keep getting these questions. How do I not know about this? How are Greek bartenders not embracing this? And like I said before, I know you want to embrace the whole global thing, but you already have. It's beautiful. The whole world, if anybody who doesn't recognize the renaissance that's going on in Greece right now in bartending, hasn't been here, or they're just clueless, all right? You come here and you feel it. Look, this, this event, this room, the passion is insane. Now is your chance to say, okay, we showed you what we do. Now let's show you who we are. Now let's show you what we've got. Let's bring back to the world something that is ours. I could go on forever, but I have a friend who wants to speak to you, and I'm going to bring him. He's going to speak in Greek. I've had it translated for me. I started to cry, so I'm not going to say a word. I'm just going to let him talk. And I'm going to say thank you for listening to me preach. I'm sorry if I got a little too animated for you. No, I'm not sorry at all. The hell with that. I am excited about what you have here. I'm excited about your single most important national product, which is you, the people. Take what is yours and show it to the rest of the world. I can't even begin to tell you what that's going to do. If I could tell you the social reform and change and development that has happened in Oaxaca as a result of them finally being able to show their artwork to the world. Children are going to school and eating and having clothes and clean water. Now, I know that there isn't that kind of poverty here, but I also know you're going through some serious issues. What could you do by supporting your own products? I'm just saying. Please listen to a friend of mine, and thank you very much for your time. Για αυτή την πρωτοβουλία και να σα πω ότι λυπάμαι πολύ πολύ να είμαι σήμερα μαζί σα. Πόσο μάλλον από εκεί μαζί σα είναι και ο Σιμ, ένα φίλο από τα παλιά. Η σκηνή των μπαρ στην Ελλάδα είναι σε πάρα πολύ σημαντική. Ειδικά μπαρ είναι μέσα στα 50 καλύτερα του κόσμου. Οι νέοι μπαρτέντε, εσεί δηλαδή, αντιμετωπίζετε με πολύ μεγάλη σοβαρότητα τη δουλειά σα, εκπαιδεύεστε, δοκιμάζετε, ταξιδεύετε, πειραματίζεστε, είστε αποσυμμένοι και κυρίω αγαπάτε τη δουλειά σα. Αγαπάτε που κάνετε. Ταυτόχρονα, οι περισσότεροι από εσά, αν όχι όλοι, είστε απόλυτα ενήμεροι και προσπαθείτε να περάσετε και στο κοινό σα την αντίληψη τη υπεύθυνη κατανάλωση. Ένα πάρα πολύ σημαντικό πράγμα για τη σημερινή κοινωνία. Αν και είμαι ενωπιό, θα ήθελα να σα πω δύο λόγια για τα ελληνικά αποστάγματα που αν και άλλο ήταν γνωστά και στο εξωτερικό πολύ πριν γίνουν γνωστά τα ελληνικά κλασικά. Μπορώ να σα πω με βεβαιότητα ότι πάρα πολλοί Έλληνε παραγωγοί και κρασιών και αποσταμάτων φτιάχνουν πια και παράγουν πολύ υψηλό επίπεδο προϊόντων. Αλλά για πολλού από εμά και από εσά είναι ακόμα συνδεμένα μόνο με μεζέλε και καφενεία των παππού. Εμεί έπρεπε να φωνάξουμε τον Στίβ Όρσον από την Αμερική για να μα μιλήσει και να επιβεβαιώσει την αξία του. Τα αποστάγματα ποτέ δεν θα μπορέσουν να περάσουν στη νέα εποχή και να αποκτήσουν την αξία που του αναλογεί αν δεν του δώσει τη σημασία. Αν δεν βάλετε στην άκρη τη προκαταλήψη και ενημερωθείτε για την παραγωγή του, ή δεν τα βάλετε σε διευθυντικέ δοκιμέ δίπλα-δίπλα με άλλα αποστάγματα ή σπίριτ. Αν δεν δηλαδή, δεν του δώσετε μια ευκαιρία να πειραματιστείτε μαζί του για να αποδεχτείτε ή να τα απορρίψετε στο τέλο, αλλά χωρί προκαταλήψει. Θα είναι πολύ ωραίο η δική σα γενιά να είναι αυτή που θα βάλει με νέο πνεύμα και νέα λογική το ελληνικό από όσα να σταβάλει. Ευχαριστώ. Γεια σα.
Stephen, and hi, Susan. I would love uh, to thank very much, Steve. Uh, I'm ashamed that you're so passionate that some, for something that uh, we were not. Uh, it, it was in a trip in. Uh, it was in Orient Express wagon, some like three, four years ago, that he made me start thinking about Greek spirits that I didn't even think about. And it was seven months ago that uh, I was tasting the chipro that you tasted now, and um, and I said it's such a pity that people in Greece will not, ne we will never um, taste this thing without can I speak in Greek? Yeah, I'm right. very emotional. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> speak in Greek. Ότι κανένα από εμά δεν θα το δοκιμάσει χωρί προκατάληψη για να πει ότι αυτό θα μπορούσε να είναι ένα νιου Westernity, είναι ένα φανταστικό ποτό. Και βάλαμε με την Ελένη να στείλουμε το μυαλό μα με ποιο τρόπο θα, θα μπορούσε με αυτό το πράγμα να το δοκιμάσουμε όλοι χωρί προκατάληψη. Και ο Στίβεν έκανε ένα κόμμα κάτω από κάτι που είχε γράψει, ε, γιατί μου είχε πει ότι οι Ιταλικέ γράπε είναι ε, υποδέστερε των ε, ελληνικών ε, τσίπουρων και έγραψε The most underestimated spirit in the world, indeed. Γι' αυτό έδωσε τον τίτλο στο σεμινάριο και ο λόγο που δεν σα λέγαμε ποιο ήταν ήταν γιατί ξέρουμε τι θα έρθετε. <laughs> ε, Εμεί, σαν Dickhot Guide, νιώσαμε την ευθύνη ε, εκπροσωπώντα ένα παγκόσμιο site στην Ελλάδα, το μεγαλύτερο σε κοκτέιλ παγκοσμίω, να αυτά τα, τα ελληνικά σπίτ να τα βοηθήσουμε να μπουν πίσω από το bar. Και ο λόγο που αυτό όλα το δοκιμάζεται ήταν unbranded, είναι όλα εμφιαλωμένα spirits. Είναι unbranded όμω γιατί θέλαμε να δείξουμε ότι κανένα δεν μα πληρώνει να το κάνουμε αυτό το πράγμα, το κάνουμε επειδή το πιστεύουμε. Και είναι κάτι που θα υποστηρίξουμε όλα τα επόμενα χρόνια. Ήδη το Μάιο οργανώνουμε ένα συμπόσιο στα πλαίσια του Tino Scoot Pads, που θα καλέσουμε πάλι ξένου από το εξωτερικό αλλά και εσά να φτιάξουμε. Καλά κοκτέιλ, όχι τσιμπουρίτο και ουζήτο, αλλά σαν τα κοκτέιλ που δοκιμάσατε με το στυλ. Σα ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ που ήσασταν όλοι εδώ. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ και το στυλ σα και το Γιάννη Σαμαρά. Ελπίζουμε σήμερα να μπει και ένα. Ούτε καν λιθαράκι, κάπω να σα μπει και στο μυαλό λίγο διαφορετικά όλη η ιδέα για τα ελληνικά κοστάγματα, για το τσίπουρο, για το ούζο, ακόμα και για τη μαστίχα. Τα αγαπάμε πολύ, θα κάνουμε τα πάντα για να τα στηρίξουμε όπω οι περισσότεροι πιστεύουν. Έτσι και το θέλουμε και ελπίζουμε να σας έχουμε κοντά μας σε όλες τις κινήσεις που θα κάνουμε και τα δικά μας προϊόντα. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ.